thank you for having me here. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to talk about how can we create low frequency information from the band limited data that we record from the field and using full form inversion uh, to utilize these low frequencies. And this is the collaborative work with Laurent de Manette. And uh, we are here at MIT at the Department of Mathematics and Energy Resources Laboratory. So before I dive into the talk of today, let me thank Felix again for inviting me to this workshop and uh, thank IIP and uh, UFRN for providing all these uh, services and support to help to have me here. And also I'd like to thank the sponsors of uh, ERL at MIT to support my research. So this is the outline of my talk today. I will first overview some challenges of full form inversion. And uh, what we propose to do is to track each individual event in the seismic record so that we can do frequency extrapolation. And after doing that, I'm, gonna tr I'm going to show you that these low frequencies are indeed reliable. Be then uh, we can use that to initialize full form inversion. And finally, I will conclude. So this is a very simple full form inversion objective function that um, you are already familiar with now. Uh, here, U is our model waveform, and it's modeled based on some current estimation of the model, which is the seismic velocity in the subsurface that we want to ex extract. And, and D here is our data measurement, what we record from the uh, field. And a full form inversion objective function was initially proposed to have this very simple form where you just directly compare the model data with the recorded data. And uh, using this minimization L2 norm, uh, we are going to hopefully to obtain a good seismic velocity of the subsurface. However, we all know that uh, this full form inversion problem is highly nonlinear. And uh, for this problem so big, we can only afford to use iterative methods to solve this nonlinear problem. And uh, another challenge is that full form inversion objective function is highly non-convex. That means uh, we have many local minima. And uh, if we are not careful enough, we'll be trapped in these local minima. So as a very simple example, the, I'm plotting here on the top a recorded trace where the uh, fundamental frequency or the center frequency is 25 hertz. And I'm going to shift this recorded record um, and use that as a model trace. And I'm going to plot the full form inversion objective function uh, on the bottom panel. So if I do that, you'll see that as we shift the model trace, the full form inversion objective function has different values, of course, and it does minimize at zero velocity error. However, you see uh, many local minima. And uh, even if you are sitting at the global minimum, the basin of contraction is very narrow. That means you have to be super close to the true velocity model in order to make full form inversion work. So this non-convex objective function is giving us a lot of trouble and challenges in practice. So there are many ways, or people have proposed, to, proposed many ways to um, overcome this non-convexity. In the first group of efforts, I call it uh, a smarter objective function. So uh, instead of comparing trace by trace, sample by, tr by sample, um, people have proposed to, in general, include this bulk shift of waveforms into the objective function. For example, what I'm showing here in solid line is the recorded data. In the dashed line is the model data. And you can see that there, there is a bulk travel time shift between these two. 
And if we use the full form inversion subtraction objective function, this will not give us a good measure. And but if we use these uh, warping technique or uh, these different metrics, we might have a chance to uh, move this model trace closer to the recorded trace. However, these type of techniques, it works the best for limited number of arrivals, and it also suffer from uh, local minimums and so on. And uh, computation of this Wasserstein metric is actually very uh, computational expensive. And in the second group of uh, proposed solutions, um, these solutions try to extend the model space so that the objective function is more convex in this extended space. So in general, it's like before we have this objective function where uh, it's only depend on the subsurface model, now we extend it to we make the data depend on another model, model space or model parameter, then uh, in this objective function, this, this objective function will be less non-convex. Of course, uh, we have to utilize some constraints on the extended model so that we will get back to the physical model space. So for example, here, Sun and Symes proposed to use a different velocity model for each shot. But in the end, with iterations, you want the differences across the shots in the velocity models to be very small. And uh, TFWI, as mentioned by uh, Dimitri this morning, it extended the velocity model into another axis, which is like subsurface offset or time lag between the source and receiver then uh, in this extended space, the objective function is much more smoother and uh, it's more convex. But in the end, you want to minimize the energy spread it along these extended axes so that you get the physical model back. And in the later talks today, uh, Mike and uh, Felix are gonna talk about AWI and, and uh, WRI where uh, the extended model is either in the data space as a Wiener filter or in the wave field space. And in all these methods, you dramatically increase the size of the model space and you dramatically increase the computational cost of full form inversion. And in the last family of remedies, what we have is uh, a group of people wants to filter the gradients of uh, full form inversion so that the tomographic component of full form inversion is enhanced. So this is actually based on uh, an observation that was published uh, like almost 30 years ago where if you look at this anomaly, there are actually tomographic components in this uh, with respect to the rays of uh, that's penetrating this anomaly. And if you look at it, the energy coming from uh, the uh, downgoing source path and uh, also the downgoing receiver path, these paths will be, uh, the, will be able to construct the tomographic compo component that we will be able to use in full form inversion. However, for this type of work to be effective, the background velocity has to be close enough. So what do we do to solve the problem of non-convexity? Actually, the most straightforward, and people have observed this for a long time, um, way of, doing, of solving this problem is to use low frequency data. And what I'm plotting here is the same data record where the center frequency now is one hertz. Of course, it has zero frequency in it. And now you don't see three arrivals, you only see a hump. And if I shift the recorded trace with respect to uh, the model trace with, re with respect to the recorded trace, the full form inversion objective function now is very nice and convex and smooth. 
So if we start from anywhere along this axis, we will be able to get to the global minimum using a gradient-based method. So why don't we do it? As we all know, the low-frequency data is missing from previous acquisitions. Um, in the previous acquisitions, the, the minimum frequency we have is like 5 hertz, 6 hertz. That's uh, pretty good enough. And even now, when we realized how important low frequencies are for full form inversion and impedance inversion, it is very expensive and very difficult to acquire these low frequencies that we need in the field. So what we want to do is to answer the question that uh, is there low frequency information in the data? And people have tried to create low frequency information from the band limited data before. Uh, for example, you can take the envelope of your data trace, then immediately you will have zero frequency. However, uh, and also another observation by uh, Wen Yi Hu, he has observed that the differences between data at two nearby frequencies are contain very low frequency information. So he observed that you can use these low frequency information between data at two nearby frequencies to do full form inversion. However, these low frequencies they created is not related to the physical low frequency data that you would acquire from this subsurface. So what we want to do is to extrapolate low frequency from the band limited data. And in order to do that, there are three steps. The first step is to do event separation. And then we represent each event very sparsely using one amplitude and one uh, arrival time term. And finally, we can reconstruct the low frequency by extrapolation. So I'm going to show you how we, are going, how we do this. And graphically, this is, suppose this is very simple recorded data we acquire in the subsurface with heavy noise and the bandwidth is 7 to 40 hertz. And we are going to use atomic event separation and create extrapolate data that's between 0.5 to 5 hertz. So in order to do that, we need to do uh, event tracking. And, uh, and we do that in two different steps. In the first step, we initialize the inversion very carefully using an explicit method called uh, music. And in the second step, we expand this initialization very carefully and slowly in frequency and space. So, to, uh, so mathematically, this is how we set up the problem. So the data model now, we transform the data to the frequency and space domain, and we assume a data record, for example, a short record, is uh, a summation of our individual events, Vj. And for each atomic event, it's defined by the multiplication of three different factors. The first one is the source spectrum. The second one is the amplitude. And the third is the phase. So in this problem, we assume we know the source wavelet to a certain accuracy. And if we, don't, we, if we don't know it exactly, and the errors in this source term can be absor absorbed into this amplitude term and the phase term here. So the model space, or the models that we want to reconstruct, is, an, uh, is the amplitude of this event and the phase of this event. So this problem is actually underdetermined as well. So we have to bring in prior knowledge about these phase and amplitude functions. So if, now if we look at this single event in frequency and space, what we know about the amplitude is that after wavelet deconvol deconvolution, the amplitude of this particular event should be almost flat as a function of frequency. And the amplitude of a continuous event in space should be smooth if you go from one trace to another. So these are the prior information we know on the amplitude. How about phase? 
for an individual event, we know the phase of this event is determined by the arrival time of this event and the phase rotation of this event with respect to the source wavelet. So if we do that, we can see this, the phase term is a, almost a linear function with omega and a smooth function with x. So this is the objective function that we are setting up, and the models we are trying to solve are the amplitude and phase of each individual event. And the first term here is very similar to the full form inversion objective function where we want the model data to match the recorded data. Differences here, uh, difference here is that uh, we are not doing any modeling or wave equation modeling. We are using this summation of the events as our model operator. And here, we add the constraints on the phase term. We have a second order derivative in omega, suggesting uh, phase should be linear in omega and uh, should be smooth in x. And for amplitude, we want the amplitude to be smooth in both omega and x. So this is a cartoon version of full form inversion, if you want, and this objective function suffers the same nonlinear or similar nonlinear and non-convexity that full form inversion suffers. To illustrate that, I'm going to show you a very simple toy two event separation problem, problem. So what you are seeing here are two linear phase functions. And we assume the amplitude is known because that's the linear part. And um, the, blue, the two blue phases, or the two blue arrivals, are the initial uh, solution. And you can see that the initial solution is uh, cycle-skipped with the um, true solution. So if we take this uh, and plot it in the Fourier domain, in the omega domain, you will see linear phase functions. That's what you are seeing here in red. These are the two uh, true phase functions. And in blue are the inverted or the initial phase functions. And if we run the full form inversion or the inversion objective function that I showed you before, this is what's going to happen. So what you can see is that the data misfit quickly drop very quickly, but it gets stuck very quickly in the local minimum. So what you observe here our um, inversion quickly gets stuck in a local minimum, and inversion result is highly re uh, relying on the initial model. For example, here, where the initial model is close to the true model, the inversion result is sitting right on top of the true phase function. But as you go far away along this axis, the initial is further from the true, and you have a further distance. And in fact, what you see, the difference between the inverted and the red here is 2 pi. And here is 4 pi. And what we observe here is a typical cycle skipping problem that full form inversion observes in practice. So what we also see here is that we have a hope to solve the problem because uh, if we know the initial solution is closer to the true, we can carry on this information in the frequency space. So that's the wise another strategy. Let's start from a reference frequency where the initial is close to the true and slowly expand the frequency range that we are going to use for the inversion and uh, constrain the expansion by smoothness in omega. This is very similar to the frequency sweep strategies that people use in full form inversion. So if we do this, what you see is that uh, gradually the information has been expanded in the frequency domain, and uh, in the end we got to the global minimum. And you see that the data misfit objective function is no longer monotonically decreasing, but uh, by using this smooth constraint, we get to the uh, solution eventually. So this is the strategy we are going to use. We will devise 
uh, we will start from a reference frequency where we know the initial is close to the true and expand it very carefully. Yeah. Yeah, this is very slow, but uh, we have a method to speed it up. So I'm going to show you how the workflow works in this very simple seismic record. But although it's a simple record, it has all the problems we have in, in the field data. It, it has missing frequencies, very severe noise here, overlapping events, and of course the problem we are solving is nonlinear and non-convex. So, so how do we solve the initialization problem? And uh, what we do is we are going to reinitialize at a single trace. And at this uh, single trace, we have a simpler data model where uh, the amplitude, we ignore the amplitude variation as a function of frequency, and we also ignore, uh, we also assume all the frequency arrive at the same time. Then for each event, we have two numbers to obtain. One is the amplitude, and the other is the arrival time. And uh, to solve this problem, uh, computer scientists and applied mathematicians have uh, developed a lot of methods, and we are choosing uh, using music, which is uh, multiple signal classification, where um, we are only using a very small portion of the data at uh, few reliable frequencies. For example, the dominant, around the dominant frequency of your data and we construct a 12-place matrix, matrix using that. And um, this algorithm is a subspace algorithm. We can do eigenvalue decomposition to separate the signal space from the noise space. Then we can do a noise space projection to obtain the estimator function. Then the peaks of the estimator function tells us the arrival time. So just to show you an example here, let's start from the trace in the middle, and this is how the trace looks like. And then if we construct the music estimator, you can see the peak of the estimator correlates very well with the arrival time of, uh, of each event. And this music estimator is constructed using three hertz of data around the fundamental frequency of 20 hertz in this case. So remember, uh, we have solved the arrival time for each event. Now we can solve a very small linear system to solve for the amplitude for each event. And then, if we assume the amplitude uh, at this three hertz window is representable for uh, all the frequencies in the data, and the arrival time is also the same for all the frequencies in the data, we can expand very quickly uh, the solution at least three hertz to the whole frequency bandwidth we have. So if we do that, we can get the initial solution for the tracking alg algorithm that looks like this. This is amount to put a source wavelet at uh, wherever you have picked uh, the arrival. And now if you compare the initial solution with the data record, you can see that they are not cycle skipped and you can do a direct comparison between these two to modify any discrepancies in the phase and amplitude. So now we can move on to the next trace. The data trace here, if you compare this with the previous data trace, you can see that they are not that different. So what we do is we use the inversion solution of the previous trace as the initial solution for the next trace. And now if you compare these two, you can adjust the amplitude and phase and to make it match better. So what we do is we iterate to convergence before uh, extend to the next trace. So if we do that, we will turn the noisy record on the left to the inverted record on the right. And you can see um, we clearly have gotten this six different, rec uh, different events and removed the severe background noise. 
And um, so this is all cool, and we can do the separation, but what we really want to do is to be able to uh, extrapolate in the frequencies. So remember, this is the solution when we consider a bandwidth of 7 to 40 hertz. And also remember, this is the data model, while well, ignoring the wavelet term, this is the data model that we have used for each trace. And what we have here is the biggest assumption for this algorithm is that uh, if we consider no attenuation in the subsurface, then we can use the same amplitude and same arrival time for all the frequencies. And with this, we can extrapolate to the frequencies that's outside of our recorded range. So we extrapolate 2.5 to 7 hertz, and this is the result. So what you observe is that the waveform has been tightened up, but the arrival time has been uh, capped. So now, comparing this original noisy record with the inverted and extrapolated record, we can see the same thing. It's much more compact. The waveform is much more compact, uh, but the arrival time is the same. So we claim this can be used for high resolution imaging. But what we think is more important is the low frequency information. And the record on the left is the low frequency uh, record by finite difference modeling. And the record on the right is that by extrapolation. So we all know it's very expensive to acquire these data in the field, but we can obtain it by data processing with relatively low cost. And these low frequencies are very important for full form inversion. But what you also observe just by visually comparing these two is that uh, they are not exactly the same. And how useful they are, how reliable these low frequencies are, is what we are going to test in the next uh, section. So uh, I'm going to test the extrapolated low frequency uh, using two models. The first one is the classic Humbert uh, cheese model. And here we are going to evaluate the reliability of the model very carefully. And uh, in the second, more complex model, I'm just going to show you some inversion results. So in this first very simple Humbert model, we, uh, what we did was we put a low velocity anomaly which is 50% lower than the background velocity uh, in the middle of the section. And we, we didn't put any uh, reflectors down below. That limits our ability to image this circular anomaly. That makes the data mainly reflection, uh, re reflection data uh, in terms of illuminating this uh, anomaly. And all our sources and receivers are on the surface. So. Uh, I tested three different cases. In all cases, we are starting from a constant background model. And uh, the, in the reference case, we have data from 1 to 25 hertz. And we are doing a frequency sweep full form immersion with 4 hertz growing window, starting from the lowest frequency that's available. In the second case, uh, we have missing low frequency, where all the frequencies below 5 are missing from the uh, from the data. And in the last case, we have the extrapolation case where uh, we extrapolate this uh, band limited data to get frequencies between 1 to 5 hertz. Then you uh, start from this constant background to get an extrapolated low wave number model. And then we will start at this low wave number model using the recorded data to do full form inversion. So uh, the inversion scheme is what I call a nested full form inversion and least squares migration scheme. Uh, it is amounts to, so this least square migration, least squares reverse time uh, migration step is similar to get some of the Gaussian-Newton uh, components. Uh, in, in this inversion. 
and uh, uh, I do five iterations of this inner iteration and uh, ten iterations for each frequency before we move on to the next frequency band. So this is the comparison of the inversion result after using all the frequency we have in the data. And the, the, the picture on the left shows you where the data is uh, from 1 to 15 hertz. And the picture on the right is data from 5 to 15 hertz. And what you can see is that uh, we can reconstruct the low velocity anomaly when we have low frequencies. But uh, when we don't have low frequency, we can only image the boundaries of this anomaly, which is what people typical, uh, typically observe in the reflection of full form inversion. And now if we look at the depth of the boundary, we can see that the boundary is mispositioned because we have this uh, low velocity. The low velocity anomaly was not uh, resolved. So um, this is the data where uh, we only have 5 to 12 hertz. And we use this data to do event separation, tracking and separation. And uh, then the dotted black line is denoting the tracked arrival time. And we use this tracked arrival time to extrapolate the frequency uh, component. So this is the phase function that we inverted in blue, and the extrapolated phase function is in red. So you can see the blue inverted phase function is not exactly a linear function, but uh, its linear approximation is it's very similar to, to the inverted. And uh, so the inverted is only from 5 to 12, and we extrapolate it to the lower band a little bit in the higher band. And this is for the top event, and this is for the uh, bottom event. And this is the extrapolated low frequency data. And uh, see, there are two events. Um, but this, this thing here is related to the fact that uh, we did not pick up all the events in the original record. If I go back here, you can see that we picked up the strong reflection event but some caustic event here that you can see a little bit has not been picked up. So this is introducing phase errors in our extrapolated data. If we compare this with the model data, you see that uh, our extrapolated data is not perfect. It's not perfect in amplitude. It's not perfect in phase. But how, how much can we use it? Is it useful? for full, full wheel form inversion. We're going to test that. So now I'm showing you the FWI result using the model low frequency data and the extrapolated low frequency data. And, and you see the overall structure is very similar, although uh, the amplitudes are not the same and the shape, if you will, in details are not exactly the same. same but the low wave number information is more, it's very similar. And if we start from these two models and run full form inversion using the recorded data, this is the result compared with uh, where we have full bandwidth data. And you can see it's not the same and it's not as good as when you have all the, data, all the frequencies in the data but they are comparable in terms of the low wave number structures. So what I'm showing here is that a full form inversion with reflection data is not a full recovery. So, why, uh, so this line here, you know that by the circles are the true velocity, but none of the models uh, is going is able to recover the full velocity. What we recover is a band limited version of this true velocity. So the band limited version is the, the one denoted by the star, and you can see it's very close to the true to the to the two inverted velocity models. 
Okay, so now let me show you an example using the Marmosi model. So the two model you are all familiar is on the left. The initial model is a one-dimensional uh, gradient model where the maximum velocity is 3,500 uh, meters per second. And uh, uh, we are also testing this in a, a strictly reflection regime where 51 shots are on, uh, placed on the surface. All the receivers are on the surface. The maximum offset is 500 meters. And uh, what I'm showing here is the FWI inversion result using uh, the full bandwidth data from 1 to 15 hertz. And if uh, starting from the 1D initial model, and uh, if we don't have the low frequencies, this is the inversion result that we are going to get. This is, uh, you can see that the low wave number feature of this model has not been updated. And the uh, position of the reflectors has been put in wrong places because of the kinematics error in the background model. And what we do, what we can do using our method is to do event tracking and extrapolation, right? So um, I'm showing a model record on the left and inverted record on the right. So visually you compare, this is a very good recovery between these two. And in this record, we have recognized nine different events. And uh, if we do the frequency extrapolation, the record on the left is the modeled, on the right is the extrapolated. And the amplitude here is normalized. And you can see um, the, the distribution or the amplitude balancing is quite different for these two, but the uh, phase information is quite reliable with the uh, extrapolated record. So we use these uh, extrapolated record to run full form inversion. The one on the left is, uh, so at low frequencies, the one on the left is using the model data, and the one on the right is using the extrapolated data. You can see uh, we do have more detailed information in the using the model data, not as much in the extrapolated data, and amplitudes are not the same, but uh, the low wave number structure of this model has been recovered quite well using the extrapolate data. And now if we start from these models and uh, run full form inversion using data above five hertz, these are the comparison. So this is the result using model data. This is the result uh, using the extrapolate data. And, um, so we, I think above two kilometers, we are uh, resolving a very good velocity model, but down deep here, because of all these dipping reflectors and the limited offsets we have in the data, we are not uh, doing a very good job in terms of resolving these deep uh, structures. But this is quite uh, encouraging because we've already been able to update the low wave number components in the model. So now this is a pseudo log comparison. Again, using reflection data only, we are not getting a full recovery. If you look at the, so the black line is the initial, the green line is the true, and uh, the red and blue are the extrapolated and modeled uh, result, emergent result. So uh, I think above one kilometer, we have a very good recovery in the shallow part. But um, between one and two, we have somewhat good uh, recovery. But down deep here, we recover the low frequency trend. But uh, there are a lot of, for example, here, the extrapolated uh, peak is quite some distance off from the two high velocity uh, uh, high velocity layer. So we are not getting a full recovery, but this is 
uh, a good initial model for full form inversion, and we are getting the low wave chamber updates from the reflections. So this brings me to the conclusion of this talk. What I'm showing you in this talk are two things. The first one is that there are low frequency information, and we can extrapolate the low frequency information from the band limited data record. And in order to do this, we do event tracking to separate them from one another. And of course, we have assumptions saying the medium is non attenuative, and then we can do frequency extrapolation. Is this entirely accurate? No. Is this uh, getting us a good approximation to the data at low frequencies? Yes, because we have tested using full form inversion at these low frequencies. And what we do is we normalize the amplitude and we rely more on the phase information in the extrapolate data to initialize full form inversion. And uh, I think that's the end of my talk, and I'd like to take any questions you may have. <laughs>